Uh, let's go to our next speaker who is joining us remotely. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Emma Howard Boyd, CBE, who is the chair of the Green Finance Institute, the chair of the London Resilience Review, which we'll see a little bit about in a minute. And she's also chair of Client Earth. Emma, welcome and good morning. You're in Glasgow with about 350 people looking at you. Good well, morning, Glasgow. Great to be here in a remote, virtual way. It's lovely to see you, Emma. We're going to firstly see an excerpt of a recent interview with you on the BBC where you presented the London Climate Resilience Review. And then we're going to have a conversation with you about that. And then you and James are going to share a Q&A together, if that's OK. So could we first see um, the BBC film, please? Now, a new report has found that rising sea levels, flooding, heat waves and drought are just some of the potentially lethal risks identified in a study into how resilient London is against climate change. Overall, the review commissioned by Mayor Sadiq Khan found the capital is underprepared for the impact of our changing climate. As our correspondent Carl Mercer reports, it's something that we've already experienced relatively recently. Tonight on BBC London, a month's worth of rain falls in London in just one day. These are the moments filmed from a mobile phone when houses in Wennington go up in flames. Right. Tonight on BBC London, heavy rain battered the capital overnight, causing flooding and disruption and sinking a party boat on the Thames. The last couple of years have seen climate change in all its forms in London. Floods hit in the summer of 21, some areas getting twice the July rainfall in just two hours. Today, some potential solutions from the former head of the Environment Agency, tasked by City Hall to come up with a plan. Every year, something like 160,000 holes are dug across London, and some of those holes could be made spongier, rain gardens, also planted up with trees that could provide shade, which will be important for some of the extreme heat that we are experiencing. A year after the floods came the drought and fires, as temperatures in London hit an all-time high, peaking at more than 40 degrees, with 387 heat-related deaths. For the London Fire Brigade, the days that we also experienced wildfires, the busiest days they'd experienced since World War II. This is having a severe impact on the resources to keep London safe. The report says London needs a new reservoir. Without it, it says drought could cost the capital £500 million a day. And work will need to be done on the Thames too, a new barrier by 2070, and improvements along the river, with levels set to rise by more than a metre by the end of the century. The embankments this side of the barrier need to be raised by 2050. That's 15 years ahead of what was previously thought. Some over 100 kilometres worth of embankments and only 7% of that is ready today. The report describes what it calls a lethal risk to vulnerable Londoners and calls for urgent action. We're underprepared, but we still have time if we act with pace and start delivering on the reasonable steps that we can take to get prepared. Commerce, BBC London. Emma, thank you very much indeed. We've, we've watched the BBC film. Uh, hopefully we've still got Emma there. I can't see her on the screen. If we could bring her back, that would be good. I want to check that. Uh, Emma, you're back with us. We've watched the film. Hello, Paul. I can hear you loud and clear. Great. And I, th I suppose the first question is, what do you see as being the importance of the London Climate Resilience Review? And is it just about London or does it also apply to other British cities? The London Climate Resilience Review, and I'll be publishing the final report at the beginning of next month, is critical not just for London, but other cities around the world. And I certainly looked at Glasgow as one of the other cities that has done a lot of work in this area. Why I was keen to show the footage from BBC London was that that was the coldest day of January this year in London. The journalists I spoke to didn't question for a minute why I was talking about the full range of climate impacts, including extreme heat. Every day since that 
interim report was launched, we have seen a major event take place around the world. So some of the things that we are recommending, not just for the Mayor of London, the businesses across London, but also national government are relevant to cities, not just in the UK, but also around the world. And it is at that city level that we have a massive opportunity to understand what others are doing in this area so that we can move at pace alongside all of the work that we need to do to reduce our emissions that James and others already this morning have so eloquently touched on. Again, I was really keen to show the video because it shows from start to finish the lived experience of our changing climate. This is real, this is happening, and we need to make sure that as we invest in this opportunity, our investments are ready for the climate change that we know is locked in, and the scientists are telling us it's getting worse. Great, Emma, thank you very much. If I may, I'm going to ask you three more questions and then we're going to hand over to questions from the audience for you and James. So the first one is really, how do you see resilience in this regard as an opportunity for business leadership? What's the role of business that you'd like to identify? The need to prepare for climate risks affects us all. And we are part of a massive system that needs to get ready for the future. And there is no doubt that to date, much of the investment that has taken place around adaptation and resilience have be, has been led by the public sector. We are now at the point where we need to both encourage green finance to look at adaptation and resilience measures, but also for individual businesses to be thinking about where they're operating, the people they're in, the communities they are working with, and making sure all of that work is ready for climate change. I think typically we have looked at adaptation and resilience, indeed many environmental and climate change related things in a separate silo. There is no doubt that we have to bring this all together. And I see that word that came to the fore in your word cloud, innovation, as being something that we need to be thinking about right now. I've been talking about some of the major sporting and cultural events that are taking place in Europe, uh, whether it's the Olympics this summer, all of that generates uh, not just the sporting events, but the knock-on opportunities around tourism. We need to be thinking about how we're ready for extreme heat. Another series of events that's taking place this summer across Europe are the Taylor Swift concerts. When Taylor Swift was performing in Rio de Janeiro last year, she had to call off one of her concerts after one of her spectators, aged 23, very sadly and tragically died of heat exhaustion. We know that this is the sort of event that we can experience somewhere in Europe this summer. And all of our businesses, our sports, culturing, cultural events, the transport opportunities, the cafes, the restaurants, the hotels that are serving this business. Indeed, I think Taylor Swift is, is coming to Edinburgh this um, in, in next month. We need to make sure that we can provide our services safely and without uh, disruption, if at all possible. Emma, thank you very much. And a lot of people in the room are, are nodding as you speak. Um, you mentioned in the BBC clip that you thought that nature and nature-based solutions and natural solutions had a role to play. Could you just expand on that? Where do you think we should, as businesses, be promoting nature and nature-based solutions? Well, uh, thank you, James. Firstly, for mentioning the Green Finance Institute report that was published a couple of weeks ago. Um, very important that we highlight the risk to GDP from not investing properly in our natural environment. 
We know that when it comes to surface water flooding, and I talked about the range of different holes that are dug across London, but across all of our cities in the UK, every one of those holes needs to be looked at through not only the services that are being delivered, but whether we can look at them as both sponges and shades, particularly in cities where we have an urban heat impact. And this is a way using geospatial data, different tools, we can look at ways of building in some of the things that will make our cities not just better from a green perspective, but better protected to the sorts of climate impacts that we are now experiencing. And as you look around the world, some of those cities that are at the forefront of the climate emergency are already looking at different types of tax incentives to make sure that we are placing nature and adaptation and resilience first. That is where the innovation should come from, by looking at the thinking that is coming from the insurance sector, the finance sector, and what businesses can do themselves. Uh, Emma, thank you very much. And one of the questions that's already come from the audience is, what is green finance? I think it might be helpful if you just continued where you were there and describe how you see the evolution of green finance and then we'll transition over to James for his reflection on the same thing and we'll get the dialogue going. So where do you see the role of green finance in all of this? I think you can take green finance with a very narrow definition and in the early days when the government first set up a green finance task force, it was very much focused on clean energy and delivering that transition. I think the more that we have looked at the range of different opportunities that exist from a green finance perspective, we've understood that we need to uh, look at this through a sector by sector basis, looking at what is the most relevant financial product. So it might be green mortgages. When we're looking at our houses, we are looking at retrofit. And I think what it is doing essentially is making sure that we are thinking about both the risks, the opportunities, embedding that in the way that we are looking at financing opportunities. And even more specifically, designing products that put environmental, climate change, and nature-related aspects first and foremost. I'm sure James can add to this agenda because of this discussion because of the range of different products that his organization have already launched to show the opportunities that exist in this space. But in some aspects, some products, we are able to raise money with that green lens at a cheaper rate because it is taking into account relevant climate change and environmental perspectives. Great, thank you so much, Emma. It's great to have you here. We'll we'll now have